Um, I am happy to be here. Uh, I have no disclosures at all. Nobody will pay me to say anything that helps their company. Um, and so, Teresa asked me to speak to you today about mental health and confession. And I tried to tell her that I was a psychiatrist, not a psychiatrist. And why do you want me to talk about mental health and confession? And she was persistent. And I started to put a talk together on mental health and confession. And I realized that I was boring myself. And if I was boring myself and putting myself to sleep, I probably would do the same thing. So I pivoted. And I'm going to give you a talk on things that I found interesting from 24 years of practice. Um, it's intended uh, to be a bit provocative, and it's not intended to be 100% um, all from the literature, a little bit, there's a lot from the literature. There's some that's based on 24 years of practice, and there's some things that just we have to think about differently. So Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is some things that have a little to do with um, mental health and concussion, but a number of other factors. So we're going to touch on sleep deprivation, a little bit on depression and anxiety. I want to talk to you about this concept of placebo and nocebo. Um, I think that's far more relevant in our conversation and what, what I do day in and day out than some of the other things. So I want to just highlight that. My practice approach, uh, headache management a little bit, and um, it, I hope it's a bit controversial and provocative um, because, uh, and I want evaluations that say four and five out of five and zero and one out of five. I, because it, Unless I get you to think and like or hate, we don't change. So we're, we're replacing livers, lungs, hearts, skin, faces, amongst other amazing interventions, yet somehow or the other, we are all seeing a scourge of post concussive syndrome that's worse now than 15 or 24 years ago when I started. Why? We can do so much, we can put people on the moon, we can do all of these amazing medical discoveries, yet we still see deterioration and a problem that seems fixable. Is it mental health? Is it iatrogenic? Have we caused the problem? Are there financial incentives? Is there some other cause? Sorry, this isn't advancing. This keyword. Sure, thank you. Okay, so many people are given a diagnosis of confession pertaining to a constellation of symptoms. And probably some rightfully. Many, I would argue, wrong. Um, for a while, if you think about what, how we treated concussions, we were sensorily depriving patients, putting them in a dark room for days, weeks at a time. Fortunately, we're not doing that anymore. Um, but deconditioning them, causing anxiety, causing problems. Um, and we have many treatments that do not have robust evidence. It costs a great deal. And for a patient who doesn't know any better, who wants to improve, when they attend weekly treatments that cost a great deal and are told that they have slight improvement. So the number of patients I see day in and day out when I talk to them about their improvement, um, yeah, I'm about the same, Doc. Okay, you're attending these five treatments. Uh, what are you getting out of them? Well, I don't know, but they keep telling me I'm better. How often do we hear that? I hear it every day. Um, there are many wonderful practitioners, but some that recommend weekly, lifelong treatments and some specialties for maintenance or for care. And I believe Mar, the profession, and all the good people who are doing wonderful work out here. Have we also become those practitioners? 
where we recommend the early lifelong treatment um, with little gains sometimes. Whether there's financial incentives, maybe for us, maybe for lawyers, doctors, therapists, vision specialists, and patients are caught in the middle and don't necessarily know better. So, case, 52 year old male involved in a rear end collision who initially felt fine at the scene of the accident. We all see this all the time. It's a ubiquitous case. What's the cause? Concussion, soft tissue, whiplash, chronic pain, sleep dysfunction, mood impairment, maybe some combination of them. Um, so, probably some combination, but I would tell you that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I started practicing, this would have been called a whiplash. Same patient, hasn't changed, would now be called a concussion. Even though, initially after the injury, they didn't have symptoms. In my mind, a concussion is somebody who has a trauma, has an altered level of some state, and subsequently develops persistent symptoms. Somebody who has symptoms that develop a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, harder to call that, in my mind, a concussion. It should have presented in some way, maybe just with a head, but with some symptom, some sort of altered sensorium, or initially. When that doesn't happen, lots of things will mimic a concussion later on. And that's my point. Lots of things look the same. Concussion looks the same as sleep deprivation, looks the same as chronic pain and mood impairment. And I just want to discuss a little bit about that today. Um, just very briefly, when you look at the evidence-based guidelines, so Sean Marshall in Ottawa has written a beautiful compendium of uh, the evidence for concussion. You should all look at it. I think they're on their third or fourth edition now. And they've, they've written about what things uh, have been proven, what things work, what things don't work. Um, and I'm just going to highlight two, two things, and then we're going to move on. Uh, one is the importance of promoting desensitization. So patients, so we don't want to put people in a dark room anymore. We want to push them to the point where their symptoms are challenged, where they might have a few symptoms, as long as they are not deteriorating, as long as they don't have symptoms for two and three and four days later. We want to actually challenge them a bit. Understanding that there's a point system, understanding that there's a some limitations to how much we push them, but we, we clearly don't want to desensitize people further. So what might we do for the patient that I've just presented? We probably would do some version of therapy, education, um, encouragement and reassurance, medication and eventually injections or some other treatment. And the longer the symptoms are allowed to persist, the more ingrained they become. So this is that concept of central sensitization. So the longer symptoms persist, the worse the patient becomes. And so this is, I think, part of the reason why we're seeing more and more and more <laughs> patients that are lingering, that are getting worse over time, um, because it's allowed to linger, not through anyone's fault, but because we, we went through a period where we were arresting them, we didn't quite understand, and now we're at a period where we are facing them and they're worried and there's so many factors pulling at uh, their treatment as I talked about at the beginning, um, that influences. So there are probably some, for these folks, mood changes, sleep changes, brain changes, and deconditioning. And if we think about a symptom, when I see a patient who has a symptom, I actually want to put that symptom out or reduce it or mitigate it. Um, because the longer the symptom is allowed to, to persist, the more likely it is to impact on it. But I have a lot of patients who say, I don't want to mask the symptom. The symptom's probably my body telling me something relevant that I don't want to mask that because that's not a good thing. <laughs> but central sensitization tells us the opposite. If the symptoms allowed to persist, it eventually becomes ingrained and it eventually becomes the new norm. So we actually do want to mask some symptoms in order to trick the brain for long enough, in order for it and the patient to gradually improve. Less of that symptom. I'm going to pivot because I want to talk to you about the placebo and nocebo effects. 
The reason I want to talk to you about this is I use this in my practice every single day. I use it more than I use it anything else. So what is a placebo? A placebo, as we think about it globally, is any treatment that has no active property, such as a sugar pill, but potentially impacts. So belief in a treatment may be enough to change the course of a person's physical illness. That's the nocebo effect. It's the opposite of a placebo effect. It describes a situation where a negative outcome occurs due to a belief that the intervention will cause harm. Um, I didn't say this, but Teresa, I, I will send you these slides if anyone wants them. They don't have to scroll them all. They, I'm happy to so share them so you can just uh, listen. So the placebo effect, the effects of patients' positive and negative experiences, sorry, the effects of a patient's positive and negative experiences and expectations concerning their health. So it has a lot to do with a patient's expectations. So it, it's impacted upon when we give a patient a treatment. When we provide an informed consent, when we educate a patient, how we educate a patient will either provide a placebo or a nocebo effect. So as an example, a patient comes to you all and you say, so this is actually well studied in the literature. Um, so a patient comes in with back pain, Dr. Mackinson, Dr. Mackinson. Um, they have two rooms, back pain. They told one room, I'm not really sure what's going on, but I think that it's mechanical and uh, I would recommend this. The other room, same patient, same uh, uh, issues. I know exactly what's going on. It's mechanical, here's what you need to do. Same treatment, only difference being I'm not sure what's going on, I think you should do this. I know exactly what's going on, this is what you need to do. The differences in those two patient populations were vast. How we present information to patients influences their day-to-day -day response to all the treatments we provide. We say to somebody, I'm not really sure, you know, I've seen this, I've seen concussions like this all the time. You know what, sometimes it takes years to get better. Um, yeah, these these are these are tough problems to have. Yeah, these vision, these balance, these uh, we have no treatments for tinnitus. When we do that, regardless if it's true or not, but when we do that, that sets their course. I, I just want you to think about how we convey information to patients. Their expectations influence their outcome. Their prior experience with medications will impact on side effects and their outcomes. How we tell them things will impact on it. Their social observations, so how they've seen in terms of other people that they've, uh, they've, they know will influence it. Um, their belief systems, they're not a medication fan. I have lots of patients who are not medication fans. If they are not a medication fan, I would already generally speaking know that most medications will cause them side effects. We'll talk about what the side effects are. So side effects are often patients sometimes experiencing a side effect. But sometimes the side effect is the patient saying to the physician or the practitioner, I don't really like this treatment. I got that side effect. I experienced this side effect. It's actually part of the nocebo effect. So a negative response impacted upon by someone's belief system. Their friends. My friend had a bad response. My neighbor had a bad response. We hear this all the time. And that will influence their outcome. So we can do one of two things and just say, all right, shrug our shoulders and it is what it is. Or we can try and educate, try and um, uh, adapt how they think. Most of what I do every single day is, I, I might prescribe a few medications. I might do a few injections. Most of what I do, the most beneficial thing I do, is I educate people. Most of the time I see people two years out, a year and a half, three years out, I educate them about their situation. And if I have the opportunity to see them early, I think I can make a big difference because I can educate them and set them on a different course than the potential course that they're on of symptoms and deconditioning by reassurance. So what and how we tell patients information absolutely influences them. If we are reassuring and we educate them about the path to improvement, to, and is relatively simple, if they 
do this, and I'll tell you my thoughts on what they should do. Um, if we tell them that it's clearly something wrong and it may take years of treatment, imagine how they're going to respond. You just set them up for that. Let's see both that. Let's just briefly talk about it so you have some uh, examples uh, so we know what you know just have to trust members. Up to 19% of adults and 26% of elderly patients taking placebos report side effects. And placebos have been studied and are shown to not just be expectations, they're shown to be changes in neuropeptides in our brain. So there are changes that are happening with placebo. And if I have Parkinson's and I give somebody a placebo, those changes are actually tailored to dopamine change. So changes with placebo have been shown not only to have neurotransmitter changes, but changes that are specific to the disease that is being influenced. Nocebo. So nocebo also has neuropeptide changes. Slightly different neuropeptides based on the literature, so cholecystokinin. Still, neurotransmitters are changing when we have positive or negative experiences with I'm just going to give you a few examples, and I'll, depending on time, I might just skip through some of these examples, but I'll give you a few examples. So, in experiments that tested the response to placebo creams, where it was described as, the cream was described as causing pain, and it was labeled as either a high price or a low price. The regions for pain transmission in the brain and in the spinal cord were activated when people expected that they would have more pain because of the higher price treatment. So, Say, treatment cream, same. One was high price, one was low price. Higher price treatment. So this is a more expensive, higher, must cause more pain, invokes more pain when they're the exact same treatment. Okay, so more changes in the brain and spinal cord. So uh, radiologically, experiments testing pain that were induced by heat. So we caused pain by heat, heating up areas and patients were provided with an opioid, um, a version of fentanyl. Uh, and in, in patients who believed that the fentanyl had been stopped, even though it hadn't been, the nocebo effect blocked the therapeutic response of the drug. So they were told, we're going to cause pain by putting heat on you. And oh, this drug that we just gave you, the, the, the opioid, stopped. Same group of individuals, people that were told it was stopped, people were told it was not stopped. Massive difference in, in that expectation and the response to pain. So I'm not sure if you can see all, uh, all this at the back, so I'll read some of this out. Post-op settings, post-op studies, morphine administered along with the instructions that the treatment that you're about to receive is potent in relieving your pain induced a substantially greater benefit for patients than covert administration, in which the patient was unaware of the timing of the drug. You tell someone they're going to get pain relief with this drug, or you just give them the drug and don't tell them, massive differences in patient's response. Beta blockers, or atenolol for cardiac disease and hypertension. The incidence of sexual side effects. If they're told about those sexual side effects versus if they're not, and then asked about it later, massive differences in who respond, who experiences and describes sexual side effects and who doesn't. Um, the last one, in a study with asthma, people who inhaled saline and were informed that it was an allergen, so something that was going to cause shortness of breath and toxic effects to their lungs. Half the patients had dyspnea, increased airway resistance, reduced vital capacity, they were short of breath, and it was just saline. Among patients with asthma who inhaled an active bronchoconstrictor, so something that made their lungs tighten, um, dyspnea and airway resistance were more severe in those who were told it was a bronchoconstrictor than are those who were told it was going to improve or expand or make their lungs feel better. Flipping over just briefly to the nocebo effect. The effect of a topical analgesic can be blocked by falsely informing the patient that a drug will worsen rather than alleviate their pain. Um, migraine sufferers. So patients that were provided a migraine treatment to visit trip down, um, as a placebo can reduce its effect against migraine attacks. 
So giving somebody a placebo, saying it's rizotriptan, even though it's not, it's just a placebo, took away people's migraines. There are myriad examples. So I'm not, you, you can read these at some point. I have lots of examples. And it is even associated with associations. So if you give somebody a placebo or a nocebo, and then you associate it with something, you take away the placebo, and you just do this, uh, the experience itself, the effect still persists. So neonates, um, babies who with vented punctures, so you're doing blood draws, um, even when the blood draw is not there, and the skin is just cleansed with alcohol, no blood draw subsequently, they will experience the pain or the, experience the anxiety. Women who have been studied with chemotherapy, who just go to the hospital when they're no longer getting chemotherapy, will experience anxiety and uh, many of the reactions that they had like they were receiving chemotherapy, the nausea, the effects of the chemotherapy, even when it's long done. Okay. Why do I bring this up? We may all be influenced emotionally, psychologically, chemically by our perceptions. Whether we provide reassurance to a patient or we reinforce their inherent, their symptoms of disability will influence them. What and how we speak to patients absolutely will affect things. I have biases, we all have biases, and I think it's important to recognize our biases. We, our biases relate to lots of things, our culture, the way we think, what we've seen, what we've learned, but we also have financial biases. We also have uh, biases where I need to feel important. I need to feel like what I'm doing has an impact. So I want to see that person respond favorably. And that's actually been well shown in the literature too. If a doctor feels or a therapist feels like they are doing a good job, they subliminally or intentionally pass that along to a patient and they, their response changes. So how I record something, as an example, I'll ask a patient, how much, how much benefit do you get? And oftentimes patients will say from a Botox or some other treatment that I've provided, um, 30 to 50%. What do doctors write something? Oh, 50% response. We all want to feel valid. And so it's great, that's, that's human nature. There's nothing wrong with that, but just understanding that and understanding that sometimes, why do patients come back? Sometimes they come back because they don't want to lose you. Sometimes they don't want to come back because if they don't tell you they've received benefit, you don't need to follow them anymore. And then they're sort of left to their own devices. And so understanding why people come back, understanding all of these factors, really will just make us all better clinicians in terms of our response, understanding the factors thinking about it, um, it doesn't diminish, like, this, I understand all this day in and day out, and it just makes me a better clinician by talking to my patients, educating them, and incur And I'll tell you my approach at the end of the day after analyzing all this. Second hit to the head. How many times have each of you seen a patient who's concussed in the, back, in the past, and then they show up, and they got hit in the head with a feather, quote unquote, with a feather. Like it was an innocuous hit. And everything's come back again. That's the nocebo effect. If they were really hit, then that's not who I'm talking about. But they come back and you think, really, you just your child just touched you and we've got a con concussion and all those symptoms again. That's the nocebo effect that we're talking about. So they're reliving an experience that was negative, that was associated with all of those factors, that's now come back. It is, we are all susceptible to the placebo and nocebo effect, and yes, there are some factors, anxiety related, that may make somebody more or less, but generally speaking, we are all um, susceptible to it. This has been well studied in the New England Journal of Medicine. I won't go through this uh, paper in any length because I'm going to present, uh, send Teresa the slides, except to say that uh, page, the last part, patients 
with things like common colds, who perceive that their clinicians are empathetic, report that their symptoms are less severe and of shorter duration than patients who did not. How we interact with people, how nice they think we are, influences their response, influences how much pain they get, influences um, their outcomes. Okay, I'm going to move on to this because um, I want to make sure we have sufficient time for other things. Because, as I said to you, I wanted to go through a number of areas um, so that I didn't get bored and I didn't bore you. Last concept of placebo, which is very important, it's not all expectations, it's not all neurotransmitters. There is also this very important concept of regression to me. What is regression to me? I might fluctuate in my day, my pain, my symptoms. When am I going to see treatment, generally speaking? I'm going to see treatment when my symptoms are here. What will happen if you do nothing? My symptoms will eventually become here. What happens if I do a treatment and you're here? I'm going to be here at some point. I'm going to be here whether you do something or you don't do something, because symptoms fluctuate. So, it's statistically been well studied where placebo, in addition to everything I just said, is related meaningfully to things will fluctuate, and if we do nothing, they will eventually get better. Because nobody seeks treatment when they're down here. People only seek treatment when they are impacted by treatment. So, regression to the mean, and so sometimes, my, I'm, I'm to blame too. I, I'm not even to blame. I'm like, I see somebody, they got better. I take full uh, accolades. Sometimes I know in my head, like, that seems weird that that got better. They didn't get better from anything else that I did. They probably were just regressing to their normal mean. So, placebo, I hope I've at least made you think. I don't, I don't plan to convince anybody here, but think that placebo and nocebo effects are powerful. They're pervasive and they're common in clinical practice. And there are neurobiologic, neuropeptide mechanisms that influence patient expectations do as well. Previous encounters with a drug or procedure and the therapeutic milieu can all generate these effects. And there are strategies to promote these effects and prevent nocebo effects in how we communicate and interact with people. The literature suggests as high for placebo as 40 to 50 percent for oral agents. Every time I prescribe a drug to somebody, they, there's an opportunity to have a placebo effect of 40 to 50 percent. This is why when you look at studies and you look at them and they're like, there's a statistical difference, but and people might have gotten 60 percent better with a drug, but they got 50 percent better with the placebo. And yeah, there's a difference, but people will often get better with doing, uh, taking a sugar pill. And the studies indicate it, that's a pill only. As soon as you break the skin with an injection, the placebo effect goes as high as 60%. As soon as you operate on someone, the placebo effect for pain goes up to 70% potentially. There's a really good study that's worth looking at in the New England Journal, not the 2021, I can send it to you, it's by Ned LeRae, where they operated on people's knees, and it's in the veterans population in the US uh, for municipal tears, and they didn't think that the surgery worked. My Melanie takes Charles Clarence. My Charles. Um, <laughs> I'm under pressure from the physician that I work. How do we stop this? It's a couple last talk. Um, okay. awesome. um, I thought it was God for a second. I'm glad he identified himself as Charles Saturday. He's really smart, so Charles Saturday may be glad. Um, so look at the study of Ned Lorraine. It's worth the looking at because they actually operated on municipal tears, and they actually did a sham operation where they took these veteran patients, they opened them up in the OR, they showed them a picture of a video of their, somebody's knee being scoped, they opened them, they closed them, 
and send them back. And there was no difference between the two, but all of them got better. It's really fascinating uh, work. Uh, first of all, it, it was rejected by the New England Journal. The first time it was uh, sent in because they could not believe that any ethics board would accept a patient having a sham operation where they actually would operate on. And then they found out, no, this is the VA. This is the veterans population of America. We're allowed to do these things. Uh, and they did it under uh, very strict guidance. It was a very elegantly done study uh, that's worth looking at. Okay. I hope I've taught, at least asked you to reflect on um, teaching people the evidence versus sales 101. Um, we don't want to be salespeople. Um, we want to do what's right by our patients. Yes, we want to feel validated, but at least we need to reflect on the literature and how it works and what really genuinely benefits our patients. How and what we say and how we communicate really makes a difference. And if you had a concussion, how would you treat yourself? This is how I think all the time. If I was paying for treatment out of my pocket, how would I treat myself? What would I pay for? I think about this all the time. I think we all should think about this all the time. Many, and I said to you, many patients return because they don't want to lose a practitioner. And I think understanding all these factors is relevant. Very briefly, I'm going to shift gears. Um, I'm going to talk to you about maybe two or three more things. Um, very briefly, I've already highlighted this, so I don't need to go into this in any depth. Um, sleep deprivation looks the same as concussion. Fatigue, memory, cognition, impaired balance, weight changes, sex drive, somatic symptoms, looks the same. Chronic pain, looks the same. Whiplash, looks the same. Chronic fatigue, depression, they all have massive overlap, such that you cannot look at a symptom complex separate from a patient, a symptom complex, and say what the diagnosis is. We all need to do a better job of looking at the injury, the mechanism of injury. How did they present early on? The number of times I see patients who were diagnosed with concussion, and you look at the data, and you look at the facts, and they presented initially with a little bit of neck pain. Four weeks later, they presented with every other symptom and diagnosed with concussion. How did somebody have a concussion four weeks later when initially they were not bad, they had some neck pain, no altered sensorium, no headache, no, uh, even if we are liberal in our definition, none of the initial presentation, yet they were still diagnosed with concussion. I think we need to be better as a medical community in terms of how we approach some of these things. Maybe it doesn't make a difference, but um, it does if we think about that concussion now leads them through a whole bunch of treatments that might be years long that might take them down a pathway where um, it's a cottage industry of treatment uh, that maybe disables people sometimes. And I do believe we need to enable them. Disrupted sleep um, presents, uh, is associated with TBI. Um, it's chicken and egg a little bit. Disrupted sleep negatively influences the brain injury. Brain injury negatively influences disrupted sleep. So it is important to treat disrupted sleep, and I'll talk about um, my approach to it briefly. Uh, there's a vicious cycle, as I just said, so one causes the other, and it just goes back and forth. Mood, same thing. When you look at the literature, um, lots of patients were depressed before, they have a concussion, and uh, they're worse, or they had a concussion and then they have mood effects. So, which one influence is which? Probably a bit of both. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but there's lots in the literature that describes the impact of mood on concussion and um, how people uh, progress. If there's definitely a chicken and egg argument uh, to be made with respect to that. There, there's a really good New England Journal article in 2008 that looks at this. Um, not a big association with mild traumatic brain injury, PTSD, depression, and physical health symptoms, um, and the importance of multidisciplinary approach uh, centered in uh, primary care and treatment. 
TBI, as we all know, not telling you anything you don't know, your affects all the circuitry of the brain, affects the neurotransmitters. So when I think about these things, I want to think about okay, what neurotransmitters might we be able to replenish or improve. So from a drug standpoint, from coconut, there's lots of things you all can do with respect to treatments and things. Um, my approach to it is slightly different because I want to know what's deficient, what area you might be up in get, how do they present today, and how, how might I target that area. Um, mood, uh, absolutely. So actually, I'm going to come back to this. Let me just talk to you about my approach. I typically see people um, a year plus more. Most <laughs> things have been tried. The number one thing I do is I educate them. So if I see them early, um, I, most of what I do is reassurance. I tell them, yeah, uh, there's nothing structurally wrong with their brain. It is important for them to be active and do things within the symptom limits. I tell them to go out for a walk. I tell them to try and do their normal activities. I try and tell them to push themselves to their tolerances and symptom limits. And reassurance is key. I, do, I don't. Uh, I do what I would do for myself. I don't tell them to rest all the time. I tell them to take a break. I tell them if the computer bothers them, take a break. But go back and do it later on that day. Go back and do it the next day if they can tolerate. I, I want people to desensitize themselves, not to the point where they're setting themselves back for days, but I want them to desensitize themselves. And while I'm doing that, I treat their sleep because. Sleep deprivation looks the exact same as many of the other problems we're dealing with. I treat their mood because that's an imperative that impacts upon their symptoms. I tell them to do exercise because the endorphins and all the neurotransmitter release they get from exercise helps them. They feel better. They're not sitting around uh, thinking about their symptoms as much. I try to get them more functional and more active, even if that's simple things like household chores. We have to get these people more active early because if we don't, they become deconditioned. And the, what I didn't mention is depression, mood, sleep deprivation, it all looks like deconditioning too. A lot of our patients are deconditioned by the time we get to them, some of which we do, some of which our literature has done by uh, uh, how we've rested people, but we need to change that. So my approach is simple. I treat their sleep, and then we move on from there. And I treat their headaches. And I'm going to briefly talk to you about headaches because I think it's one of the areas that I can do something about and have a meaningful impact on people. Um, pharmacologically, there's lots we can do and prescribe. There's over-the-counter meds, vitamins, melatonin, and others. Um, as I said, I sort of went in lots of different directions, and I understand that this would be confusing, but I wanted to learn things myself as I was doing this, so I'm just going to continue to share my path and my journey here. Um, so I went down the path of the nutraceuticals, um, the vitamins. just wanted to know a little bit more. I'm not professing to be an expert here. Look it up, do your own homework. Uh, but I, what I learned was that 62% of adults in the United States use some form of complementary and alternative medical treatment. Rigorous clinical trials of uh, pharmacotherapy and nerve depression disorders have shown to have a placebo rate, as I talked to you about, 50%. Billions of dollars are spent on herbal remedies and dietary supplements in the U.S. Although often sold in pharmacies, these products are not subject to the U.S. FDA regulations. Preparations of the products vary widely. So, including when they've been subsequently analyzed, melatonin has other substances in it, serotonin related meds. Um, substances that are herbal, that are shown to work on treating UTIs, have antibiotics in them. The regulation of this industry. Is not for us. And as such, if you think about the literature behind it, there's very little literature when I reviewed it that supports it. So I just went through a few that I thought were commonly used. So I looked at melatonin. People love melatonin. What does it do? What does it not do? Um, so 
when you look at the literature, it's not particularly potent. It probably works to augment the endogenous um, circadian signals. Probably helps a little bit with sleep. And when you look at the literature, what it does is it helps with initiating sleep. And it helps with a little bit of quality of sleep. But it does not help maintain sleep later in the night, and it does not endure. So it helps early, it helps for short lived periods of time, and it helps them get to sleep. Um, and when you look, when they studied and looked at the actual amount of uh, drugs that you need, the literature varies. Um, it's anywhere between micrograms and 20 milligrams. So it's not clear what dose a given individual needs um, when prescribing or having them take melatonin. And there's some, there's one article that I looked at that suggests that even as low as a milligram or less may be effective. Um, so the literature on melatonin is out, but I would say that it seems pretty innocuous. I, I, I think if patients want to use it, I have no issue with it. Um, it probably helps with their initiation, it's not that quality. There's lots of other drugs. Um, sorry, Kava Kava. Um, never heard of it uh, prior to my living. Uh, there's two meta analyses looking at that with multiple randomized trials. Unfortunately, all of the trials have flaws in them. They're the studies that uh, have been paid for by the uh, manufacturer of the product itself. And so, as soon as a drug or a product is uh, produced and studied by the same company. There's an inherent bias there that we have to at least be wary about. Um, but even when you look at it, the effects are only slight for the management of anxiety. Um, there are side effects uh, here with respect to this, including hepatotoxicity. Valerian roots. Um, so I won't go through all these in the interest of time, but I've provided it for you and I'll send it. Um, the bottom line for all of these is every study that looks at these have methodological flaws in the study, and every single one of them has uh, biases with respect to who did the study, paid for by the uh, companies that made the product. Red flags should go off for you all when you see this. So I'm going to go on. Chamomile, passion flower, there's lots of saffron, St. John's warts. Um, read the, read the uh, uh, submission I'm going to provide for you. Prescribed antidepressants. Dr. Tatter talked about this briefly. Prescribed antidepressants, when you look at the meta analysis, shows significant reduction in depression scores after TDI. So, probably for a multitude of reasons, including that brain chemistry, the circuitry is off, circuitry is off, will affect serotonin and dopamine. Um, when that's off, probably makes sense to replenish it. And when you look at the literature, it does make sense to replenish it, and it does help people who are depressed. Simple basics, start low, gradually go up, follow side effect profiles for people. Um, the one drug that seems to be the most beneficial, and this is written up in the guidelines, is an SSRI. The least side effect profile, generally speaking, um, and uh, effective for most patients who have uh, depression, generally speaking, as well as post-brain injury. There are a number of different agents we can use, but I will tell you that I tailor each agent according to the symptom I'm trying to treat. Um, I'll tell you briefly about that in a second. Tricyclic antidepressants as an example. Nortripoline, amitripoline, um, they don't work great for depression, but they're wonderful for sleep. They're wonderful for headache prophylaxis. They're great as muscle relaxants. Clonidine and press, not very useful for depression, but very effective for nightmares and post-traumatic stress. So using side effects of the drugs to target a specific area is worthwhile. SSRI is great for depression. But if I have a person now who's having a problem with sleep, probably we'll pivot from an SSRI to something like Remeron where it'll help, it's an atypical antidepressant, but it'll help their sleep. Or if somebody is really worried about sexual dysfunction, I might give it then to something like bupropion, um, which will also help them with stopping smoking. So as much as we can do that prescribes one thing that also happens to help another area that somebody's struggling with, 
that doesn't also make an area worse that is important to them, whether it's sexual function or something else, we need to try to do. And it's always part of our approach. So, okay. I'm very quickly going to go through, in my mind, that uh, I've actually I talked about this, the light and ground of how some medications that I might consider, that I might use. Is that five minutes? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I might use for uh, treatment. So I, uh, TCAs and nortripline use all the time for sleep. Um, it's great for sleep and depression. Um, Ritalin. Ritalin is a great drug uh, that helps with lots of things post-training. Helps with attention, helps with concentration, helps with fatigue. Um, and the issue with Ritalin is uh, addiction potential. So you have to be careful, you have to make sure that you're aware of who you're treating. Um, do it with caution, but it has potentially a meaningful impact. Uh, those individuals that you see that have inappropriate laughter, inappropriate crying, we've all seen the pseudo-vulgar laughter. Uh, Dextromatorcan with or without quinidine works. SSRIs and TCAs work if it bothers them. Some people it doesn't bother them. And so it doesn't mean treatment if it doesn't bother them. But there are treatments that do help them. Anger and agitation. We have meds that actually can help with that. Beta blockers. I like beta blockers more than I like antipsychotics. Antipsychotics reduce dopamine. Dopamine is important for our brain and our memory and all those things. So um, we have drugs that do help, and it's a matter of finding the right uh, constellation of uh, drugs. Um, I've been given five minutes, so I won't uh, go through this, other than to say, the one thing I think physiatrists and others can do that help your patient, aside from what we just talked about, is we can treat headaches. So many times, patients are bothered by headaches after a concussion. The, the headache impacts on their sleep, impacts on their mood, impacts on every aspect of their life and their outcome. This is the one thing that I would say we, I can hit a single or a double with, maybe even a home run sometimes. Headaches are treatable. And we just have to figure out what type of headache they have. But then the options are, like do they have migraines, do they have neck pain, do they have occipital neuralgia? Um, we have to figure out what type of treatment, what type of headache they have. And once we figure out what type of treatment they have, there are a multitude of treatments. And I am finally excited about headaches. Um, and historically, I have not been. But we now have, in addition to all the drugs we've had, we now have drugs that meaningfully help people um, with their migraines and their headaches. And I use these drugs uh, all the time in my practice. Um, they are new generation CGRP receptors. CGRP, calcitonin gene-related type that. We work on the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve is now thought to be an important migraine producer, important headache producer. If we can block the trigeminal nerve CGRP receptor, which a lot of these drugs now do, we treat migraines, we treat their headaches, and not as pain focused patients. Are Conclusion, so mood dysfunction is important. Post-brain injury, as we've talked about. Uh, I really believe we have to focus on how we educate and how we reassure and help our patients and try to incorporate placebo, try to avoid nocebo. And treat targeted areas because we do not want them to become ingrained. The more they become ingrained, the worse patients do because they, the symptoms persist and they get that central sensitization. And lastly, I would say we do need to encourage exercise, even as simple as a daily walking program. I tell every one of my patients, I don't care what symptoms they have, they have to do some housework and things around us to keep them busy and productive, and they have to go out for a walk more than once a day, 15 minutes, two, three times a day. It's a great thing for Thanks. Any questions? We might not have time. That yeah, would be helpful. Question somebody else does, but I'm a lawyer. That's a potential risk. 
some cases, they've been in the hospital and they've had severe facial injuries. Nobody's diagnosed with infection because it's just not a survival thing. And when they come to me, I have to ask the questions. I've been doing my job. Well, how do I do that and not interact? That's, that's yeah. really the question. I think it's a great question. And uh, so, uh, for those who've been here, uh, Chris asked, um, there's sometimes circumstances where people are not diagnosed with a concussion, or probably have had a concussion, but just didn't know what I'm saying. Um, and uh, how to you know, direct that or um, help navigate. And I would say, as much as I talked about how we may overdiagnose concussions, Chris is absolutely right that there are circumstances where concussion is not diagnosed. And for me, it goes back to what was the mechanism of injury? And even if they didn't have the initial uh, presentation, even if somebody didn't document that they presented an X, Y, and Z, somebody's got a facial fracture, a facial trauma, for me it's pretty simple. They probably had a concussion. That's not who I'm talking about, right? So if somebody's had a mechanism of injury and the trauma facial clinic was so busy fi fixing Humpty Dumpty's face that they couldn't document that the person also was confused, that's okay. That person's had a concussion. Like this is, some things are pretty simple that the documentation won't be there. That's fine. The cat can present eight weeks later because the trauma team had more important things to do than document their confusion. So all I'm saying to you is we just need to make sure that the pieces fit together, the mechanism of injury fits together, and when we put it all together, sometimes it won't be diagnosed, sometimes a concussion will be missed early, and I, I see that too. So even though I talk about how I see overdiagnosis, I also see missed, I actually don't see misdiagnosis because I only see concussions, um, but I think we all, you all, actually will see missed concussions, and it's important for you to diagnose it, but not based solely on symptoms. Go back and look at the mechanism and all those other factors. It's a great question. Thanks. Thank you.